Okay, let's begin. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we're going to continue our conversation on confidence versus credibility. Um, I want to make a note again, there's no in person class on Friday. I'll be posting a lecture tomorrow, though. And what I think I'm going to do for the lecture, because I don't want to spend a lot of time without the interaction with you guys talking about GIP sampling and MCMC in general. So I want to kind of redo the motivation, but what I'll do in the lecture that I post on Friday is tell you what the samplers are and how to use them. And so that's the easy part. They're relatively straightforward, what you do with them, how they work. Um, of course, the theory and understanding why they work is a whole different ballgame. Um, and I'm not even sure that I'm going to do that in its full-blown glory. There's one little wrinkle in everything that I'm going to skirt around. And it won't bother you, and I'll point it out what it is. And if you want to know more about it, then eventually I'll teach it to you when I teach an MCMC class again. So I haven't done that for a little while. But we're going to bury a lot of that stuff in here. If you want to know what the wrinkle is, it's time reversibility. So is the chain the same forward and backwards? And I'll, I'll make a statement that it is, but I don't want to even teach you really what that is exactly, because I'll have to teach you much more Markov chain theory than I would like. So, so consider this kind of a sampler platter of MCMC in this class that we're going to be putting out there. But I'll, I'll show you what the things are, and then I'll show you how to make it and understand it, understand some of the theory, and I'll point out the one little piece that I'm leaving. So hopefully that will suffice. So on the homework, there's a lot of MCMC. And so hopefully I'll tell you enough so you can get started and start at least implementing everything. And if you're like me, the first time you saw it and you coded it up and didn't know the theory, you'll be delighted to see that it actually works. So uh, this is amazing. Um, and so next week I'll be telling you all about that. Um, the part of the conversation that we're on, the example, I'm pulling the example out of this paper, could Fisher, Jeffries, and Naaman have agreed on testing? The answer is no, they could not. They didn't, they never did. Uh, and most of my colleagues don't agree either <laughs> so, on how to do it. Later on in this class, we'll be talking about what the issues are, and I can tell you what they're disagreeing on so that at least you can understand both sides of the argument, so you can understand what people are disagreeing about. What I find, just one second, Patrick. Um, what I find is that when I hear most of the arguments, people don't know what the other side is actually talking about. So they usually invoke a false argument. And I'll tell you exactly what the issues are. So that's coming in about a month's time. Um, while we're not testing, so what I mean is that null hypothesis thing, there is a correspondence to intervals. So testing and intervals. A lot of times a confidence interval might be defined as the region in which you would fail to reject the null hypothesis. So you might be developing that. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence with that. So we're going to be talking about this in the, the context of confidence versus credibility. And it's their first example. I'll just kind of scroll for you. You can see this example pops up. It's in here somewhere. Almost, almost, almost. Conditioning, this is the example that we're going through, example two. So if you want to just jump to that in the paper and not read through all the testing issues and save that for later, that would be good. So I point these papers out just as um, good scholarly academic behavior. You're supposed to read papers once in a while. And they probably tell you more than they should in a lot of papers. They, they do a lot of things and tell you what people think. They cite a lot of stuff. And so you're learning the literature every time you read a paper. These are really good papers. One of my favorites. Pat? You kind of answered my question. I was going to ask what you meant by testing. Sweet. Awesome. OK. So we'll be going through this example again. Um, homework is up online. I'm most likely going to extend, but there's several things you'll want to get started on. Um, this says I want you to sample from a Cauchy 01, but I, you know, X and Y are going to be marginally Cauchy 01, but I want you to build some correlation between the two things. 
there's a couple different ways to do that. So you can either use a package. So keep in mind, the multivariate Cauchy is a multivariate T with one degree of freedom. That's what a Cauchy is, T with one degree of freedom. Um, so if you have a package to sample that, you can. Um, I will point out that if you just take two Cauchy draws and you try to correlate it through this by taking the Cholesky factor, so if you take two IID Cauchy's, take a Cholesky factor of that covariance matrix, multiply it into it, that will not give you a bivariate Cauchy. That trick does work for normals. So what you usually do is something like this. So X and Y, if these were normally distributed, so I'll write down normal zero, zero mean, and covariance matrix sigma, so that's a two by two right there. If I change this right here to, let's say, sigma times i, now these two things are NID. There's no covariance because this is the identity matrix. So this is equivalent to x is going to come from a normal zero sigma. I'll write sigma squared in there. And y comes from a normal zero sigma squared. Now what you can do is you can come up with this thing right here. Sigma to the one half. So that's the square root of a covariance matrix. How do you get that? How do you get the square root of a matrix? What this means is that I have some matrix, I'm going to call it A, just for convenience, that if I take A transpose A, it's equal to sigma. So that's what I mean. So I come up with a matrix factor such that if I multiply it into itself, what I mean by that is I take the transpose and I multiply it into itself, I get back the original matrix. This is not unique, and there's a lot of ways you can do this. So some people might do something like write down sigma. If you take your eigenvectors, you take your eigenvalues, you take your eigenvectors, this sort of thing, then this right here would be V transpose lambda half power, this is a diagonal matrix, V, that thing. So I just, what I mean by that is I take these things, lambda one, I take one half there, lambda two, one half, zero and zero. So you just take your eigenvalues, you take the half power of it. That is the slowest way to compute this. So if you know much about numerics, it's computationally most expensive thing you can do. Finding an eigensystem of a matrix is about the most strenuous thing you can do. So there's other ways to do it. There's a faster way to come up with these things right here. And there's a what's called a Cholesky factorization. And so if you end up doing this right here, Chol, sigma, it will return to you some matrix. That is not going to necessarily be this one right here. There's an infinite number of representations of this. You can kind of convince yourself of that. So, but there is a command, and it stands for Cholesky factor. And it'll give you this. Cholesky factors exist when? Does anybody know? Has anybody heard of a Cholesky factor before? I'd be shocked if you never came across it. It would tell me that you never took a second linear algebra class. You should take that. All of us should. Um, when I was doing numerical analysis, they'd have us code these things up, you know, implement it, implement it the fast way, implement it the stable way, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. It turns out there's an if and only if statement that if sigma is positive definite, meaning it has all positive eigenvalues, then the Cholesky factor exists. 
That's a little bit strong. There can't be a zero eigenvalue in there. And so some of your implementations won't work on that. So some of the naive ones that they might teach you in your first linear algebra class. But to check if, to see if a matrix is positive definite, and this is the definition, it can be factorized like this, or every submatrix is positive definite and has positive eigenvalues. All of those are equivalent statements. Um, the fastest way to check positive definiteness is to see if the Cholesky factor exists. You'll divide by zero somewhere if it doesn't in the algorithm. Just stuff that you should know about. But if you ended up doing this, taking this Cholesky factor A and taking A transpose XY, this thing right here will be distributed normally with mean zero and covariance sigma. Okay, so just like when you are going to rescale something, you don't multiply it by sigma squared, you multiply it by sigma, and it gives it variance sigma squared. This is the multi-dimensional analog. This works for normals. It's really great. This will not work for your Cauchy representation. That won't work. So I'll just tell you a few things about it. So for Cauchy, I'll just make a point, because I see this plot every year. Five of you do this. And it should be obvious that it, from your result, that it can't, it's not right. So for Cauchy, you cannot take A, multiply it by X, Y. This will not be equal to a Cauchy zero sigma. And I'll just say X and Y, I got these from a Cauchy zero identity. So I sampled them independently. You can do those in sequence. If I multiply it by a Cholesky factor, where this thing is the square root of sigma, this is not Cauchy. I'll try to make that more clear. So what happens, why this isn't true, is because if I sample these x and y's periodically, and you should know this from your last homework, every once in a while there's a value that's way out there. And so, what is this thing doing right here? This is really just a rescaling of everything and a rotation. So when I multiply by something, it kind of rotates things around for me. So it's building a correlation in everything. So when I'm sampling these independently right here, every once in a while, one of, the, one of these things will jump out to some extreme value. A bivariate Cauchy has both of the margins jumped out at the same time. So if I ended up sampling this way, right here, before I rotate everything, I'm going to see values in here around the origin, and then every once in a while something will jump out. It jumped out in the x direction. I'm seeing values that kind of look like they're around the origin, and then all of a sudden something will jump out. And this will happen periodically. So I'll have these things that jump out in these margins. When I do the rotation, it's just going to rotate this. And so you'll have this weird cross shape that shows up. That's not what a bivariate Cauchy does. Bivariate Cauchy looks like this. So x, y, if this was a bivariate Cauchy, with some correlation structure, 0.8 is pretty strong. So that's pretty high correlation. Um, this right here should look like this. They're rotated. The correlation is positive, so I'll have something going in this direction. And so when things jump out, they do them together. So boom, there'll be a value over here. And then I'm sampling from this, and then Bang, it jumps out. I do some more sampling. Everything looks kind of like it's in the, the Massey region. And then boom, into the tail. And every once in a while, you'll have these values right here. 
you know? It's, it's like that, right? Because she's are crazy. And we like that heavy tail behavior. I use it all the time to not influence things. So it makes a big difference. So these don't show up in a cross. So you can either multivariate T, or you can do this other trick. So to get this, you can do this. If you can sample from a multivariate normal, if you only knew how to sample independent normals, you could take that Cholesky factor and come up with multivariate normals. So you always know how to do this. If you give me a uniform sampler, I can create these for you. So I can probably create anything just getting uniform and doing transformations that I know. So if I did do this, you should ask yourself, do you know how to do it or do you just know how to use the code? You ask yourself that enough times, and you answer those questions. You'll be really good in a few years. So, if I got these, these would be multivariate normal. But I could also do this: take this little gamma term. So I'm going to divide by gamma, and let gamma come from a gamma. <coughs> There's some number of alpha and beta that makes this work. So if I take this gamma, I shove it into there, I get an xi yi pair. If I do this over and over and over again, it'll be some t distribution if alpha and beta are equal to each other. If I pick this to be one half and one half, that's my magic Cauchy number. It turns out this is the degree of freedom. So it's nu over two, nu over two turn it into a T with degrees of freedom of new. We've been studying that. It's called the scale mixture representation. So I can use the same scale mixture representation, sample the gamma, plug it in here, sample from a normal, it will now be coached if you do this. So that's kind of cool. When this is a really small number, I divide by something small. It makes the entries in here effectively very large. And that's where I get that guy. That's what's happening. That's kind of cool. So, computational land, if you know these mixture representations, you can usually use them to build models. So, we'll be talking more about that. So, this is just a heads up. If you want to implement it from scratch and you only have a uniform sampler, you know the steps. You can also do this just by pushing the T with one degree of freedom sampler. R has it built in. For MATLAB, you'll have to go to the MATLAB repository and download it. No big surprise. Okay, so you can sample those things. If you fit a regression line through everything, keep in mind this is the our old regression line. If you do this, it won't fit very well. Basically, these points right here will move your regression line along. And so they usually tell you, get rid of all that stuff. Like, pluck those points off and then fit normal. I hate that because that could be a real point. That's telling you something. So like on the stock market, when we assume everything's normally distributed, then we get shocked every few years. We have some collapse. Looks more like a Cauchy process. So anyway, um, this won't work. So I tell you to plot the residuals, make a QQ plot against normals, and you'll see that uh, they don't line up very well. If you don't know what a QQ plot is, you can ask during review session. I'm happy to tell you what these things are, but look it up. So it's one of my two favorite plots. I use them all the time. Okay, under the gamma normal scale mixture model, I can change these betas into Cauchy draws. That actually doesn't fix the problem on its own. So keep in mind the way we're sampling it is there's a different gamma for each xi, y, i pair. So I can move the whole vector in a Cauchy way, but we don't want to do that. We want it to be individual for each one of the things. And this problem is going to walk you through that. And so you can get started on it. I think you can do this full problem. Anyway, um, I do ask you to eventually write down the GIP sampling procedure. Just write out the pseudocode. I'll tell you what GIP sampling is on the Friday lecture. You should be able to write out conditional distributions. And I'll be explaining what that means, but we've been studying conditional distributions. We're going to use all those conditional forms that we studied early in class, and we use them in GIP sampling. So all those 
forms where I say, imagine you want the posterior for mu, but you know sigma. It's kind of a, it's, it's a fiction. You never know sigma. So when I, I did this problem, imagine you're trying to infer sigma and you didn't, and you know what mu is in the normal distribution. Those are called full conditional distributions, or conditioned on all the other parameters. Those are what you're sampling from in a Gibbs sampler. I'll go into more detail in the next lecture. We'll pick up there uh, on Monday. Um, here's some identities we're going to use when we get into Wishart distributions. They're the distributions that model these covariance matrices. It's actually the inverse covariance matrix, the precision matrix that Wishart model. We'll be talking about it. We need these identities. So trace of A plus B is equal to the trace of A plus trace of B. I can actually envision that proof in two lines. It's really easy, especially if you know what the spectral decomposition is. Be the, probably the way to do this. Um, or just the sum of the diagonal is effectively the trace. So the sum of the diagonal of this thing is the sum of the diagonal plus the sum of the diagonal. It doesn't matter which one you sum the thing. This one's a little bit harder, but not too tricky. Um, trace of AB is equal to the trace of B. So if you don't remember how to prove that, but grab your linear algebra book, they're certainly in there. Um, I'm going to give you a problem concerning, this is kind of the first GIP sampling paper. It's the precursor to the big JASA paper written in 1990. This is a 1989 paper written by the same authors plus some scientists. I'm going to show you what this model is. And when I go into a lot of detail on GIP sampling, I'll tell you about the problem that they use to um, highlight why you might want to get sampler. I actually think this is a pretty clunky model, but if I think back to 1989, um, computers were a little bit different then. So the model is pretty arcane, I would say, compared to today's standards. But back in the day, this would be a hard thing to play around with. In the back. Is that a typo? Is it rat I, not rate I? Yeah, it is. Good I. So yeah, of rat I in the J. Thank you. So there's some model for that, and we'll be talking about this model next week as well. Um, I'm giving you the paper as well, so you can kind of have a look at it. You can see how old it is. It's like pre-LaTeX. So it's kind of amazing. It's not pre-LaTeX, though. So this is like typeset by somebody's secretary, it looks like. It looks like horrible. So anyway, this is how paper's useful. Um, so you can read through it. There's some values in here, and in the next homework, I'm going to ask you to use those values and actually code up the Gibbs sampler and see if you agree with their conclusions. Um, they do inject quite a bit of prior information here, so they talk about it in the paper. So here's the data <laughs> that they used. I think they've got another little data set in here. So I don't give you the data, I let you just grab it from the paper. Uh, here it is. Here's the data. I'll send this out to you so you don't have to type it all in. So if you type it all in, you're destined to make a mistake. It's kind of like that plus. So, okay. So I have written all this down, and I'll be sending it to you on the next one. So if you're dying to code up the GIF sampler, it's coming. Okay, last problem on here. I'm going to need to tell you what. Um, there is a problem with some more MCMC stuff after Friday's you know, mini lecture that's going to be online, this will make a little bit more sense. So I'll be walking you through the implementation. So I'd say hold off on problem five. Problem six, uh, you can work through this one. The answer here is multivariate T. So in the multivariate setting where the XIs are correlated, I want you to do the same problem where you find mu after you marginalize out the covariance matrix. So when I integrate over a matrix, what I really mean is we integrate over ele every element in the matrix. Keep in mind, a covariance matrix is symmetric. So in a two by two covariance matrix, if I'm integrating against it, I'm integrating against three terms in that matrix. Because one of them shows up twice. So that's what it means to integrate against the matrix. You probably don't want to do that integral. Um, so knowing the normalizing constants, of distributions is helpful here. You can get started on this. I probably need to give you a linear algebraic identity to get you to the very end of this problem, but at least try to start. See if you can do that integral. 
does turn out to be multivariate T. Problem seven, I need to tell you what Jeffrey's priors are before you can do this as well. So again, we'll probably need an extension, but please get started on the stuff that you can do. There's a lot of reading, a lot of thinking, a lot of setup in this, but I'll probably give you an extra week. Okay, let's get to this paper, Jim Berger's paper. And this caused quite a stir, and people still like to argue about these things, so we'll at least set up the argument and see what they're arguing about. So last time, we're thinking about this Bernoulli sampling. We ended up getting two values, xi's, are going to come from a, I'm going to write it out like this. So I'm going to say it's xi is either going to be theta plus one or theta minus one. This is going to happen with probability one half, and this is going to happen with probability one. So you get to know the probabilities in this model. What you don't get to know is what theta is. And the name of the game is we're going to try to learn theta. So we're going to see two draws right here. So there's only two draws. If I saw a lot of draws, I'd be able to figure out what theta was. With just two, maybe. Depends on if they're the same draws or not. So from my front again, um, we'd ascertain the confidence set it's just not an interval, it's a coverage thing. It doesn't matter if I disconnect it and just have points, it's the same concept. So confidence set, here's a 75% one. And you might want to be asking yourself, how did they get it? You know, and you should ask yourself that all the time. I'm always looking for insight on developing methods. Like, what's my process? What am I thinking about? Do I have a, a process that I use to get this? They just kind of throw this out there. But this is true. This is a 75% confidence set. It's a function of my two draws. And this thing was just going to be um, x1 plus x2 divided by 2, aka the average if x1 is not equal to x2. They're different numbers. And arbitrarily, we're going to report back x1 minus 1. Now, you, you might think, hey, is that what I should report back? We'll, we'll answer that question later. So this is going to happen if x1 is equal to x2. So they're the same values. And last time, we, we convinced ourselves this is always the right number if this is true, right here. And this happens 50% of the time. So this happens the other 50% of the time. So we're in one of these two cases. Either x1 is equal to x2 or it's not. What's the probability that they match? Well, we can just think about the second draw. So we're going to get something, either x1 or x2. What's the probability that I match it on the second draw? One half. So this happens with probability one half right here. And this thing is going to be theta plus one plus theta minus one divided by two. Those things cancel. I have two theta divided by two. This is equal to theta. So this is always theta right here. And this one was a little bit arbitrary. This is going to be equal to theta 50% of the time. It's either x1 minus 1 or x1 plus 1. It's one of those two things. So I either add 1 or I subtract 1 from it. I don't know what to do. And so this happens 50% of the time as well. So at the end of the day, 50% chance of getting something right that happens half the time, plus 100% chance of getting something right, that one. It happens half the time. If I add these things together, this is 75%. The trouble with this answer is just the interpretation. So I don't really have a huge problem with this answer in itself. 
but I don't like the interpretation of the confidence set because I'm supposed to say regardless, whatever answer I give you, 75%. How confident are you? 75%. So that's not a belief statement about theta. Confidence is a statement about coverage on everything. And so if I repeated this over and over and over again, I would be covering the true answer 75% of the time. So 75% of the time, I'd be reporting back to you the truth. And that's what confidence is all about. But I don't get to, in the middle of it, change what my confidence level is. I've got some confidence level. Uh, you would probably say what you should report back is maybe 100% there when I see this case and 50% here. And I'll try to get to that. But on its own, confidence doesn't do that for you. It's not this conditional statement depending upon the data you observe, at least not in general. Confidence is a statement about the process. So it is an a priori statement about process. You know, people don't like prior beliefs or thinking about things in prior ways. Confidence is like a fundamental one. Just because we don't use the word a priori there doesn't mean it's not an a priori statement about the process, not about what you're giving. So confidence is not a statement to the scientist or engineer about how good their answer is. It's a statement about my process in giving out good answers. So it's an air rate on me, not on the specific answer we've given. And that kind of sucks. That's the thing that everybody's like, I don't get it. You know, I don't like that. That doesn't sound good. Um, and that's where the argument comes in. So what is confidence? What does that word mean? It's just a word. It's a word game. Um, how do you come up with different confidence sets? You know, you should think about how do you do this in general? Do you have a mechanism for coming up with confidence set? They give you the understanding that you'd like. I don't know one in general for specific problems. Maybe I do. But in general, there's no real procedure out there. Let's think about what a Bayesian does. So a Bayesian does something very different. In a Bayesian, at least we know what they're going to do. They're going to write down the likelihood function first and then start thinking about what are good prior distributions. And why should I pick certain prior distributions? What's the property of that prior? What impact will it have on my answer? So at least I have a process. So step one, understand what the sampling distribution is, and then write down a likelihood function. So credible intervals. So I'll say credible set. So what do we do first? So we need to find the posterior. This is the thing that all Bayesians are doing. How do they do it? Likelihood times prior. So, so this is pi theta given my two values, x1 and x2. So what is that going to be? It's going to be proportional to the likelihood function given x1 and x2 times whatever my prior beliefs are. And we'll talk about this second. Let's talk about this first, and then we'll talk about this. I like to understand the nature of the parameters. What are they? So it's not so much that somebody's told me what theta is, and they say it's in this range with this probability distribution. That has never happened in my life. So just maybe in like an undergraduate class to give you problems like that. So in general, people don't do that. And if they did, I wouldn't believe them anyway. So I need to go verify that for myself. Okay, so let's just write down what the likelihood function is. So the likelihood, usually to get the likelihood, I usually write down the joint sampling distribution. Same equation, different functions of different arguments. So the joint sampling distribution, let's just write that down first. These are all independent, so I can just think about what is fxi given theta, and then I'll product the two things together. So what is this? It's a Bernoulli coin flip, right? Just this probability of something happening. So 
this is going to be equal to one half. It's going to be one of these two things. Remember, it's just a probability statement. So I might try to appease my friend getting in the back and write down PR. So you know this is a probability. I kind of like it in this case. So this is just probability. We know it's a half, no matter what. That's not too useful. So I could write down that this is either going to be a half or a half. This is when um, I'm going to write this down as a delta function, that xi is equal to theta plus 1 times 1 half delta function xi is equal to theta minus 1. So delta xi is equal to whatever, I'll say, um, Z is going to be my argument right here. This is equal to a 1 or a 0. If xi is equal to z, it's a 1. Otherwise, it's going to be an xi is not equal to z is going to give me a 0. So it's a switch. And so you can kind of think about the Bernoulli problem. Usually, what we're putting up in the exponent are 1s and zeros. If it's categorical stuff, we have to re-encode it to 1s and zeros. And so this looks a lot like my likelihood, so I guess. So just keep in mind, this thing right here is a half, no matter what. So that looks like the joint. That looks like at least the marginal sampling distribution. Who agrees that this is it? You? What do you think? Yui to agree. So if I got Yui to agree, I've gotten a lot of you to agree. This looks like it's it. I'm going to give you a, a hint at this. And a lot of people would write this thing down. It doesn't have anything to do with theta at the end of the day. There's no theta in there. So when people write down likelihood functions, they don't have parameters in there. My mind explodes. You know? It's one of the things that can cause me frustration while I'm grading. You know? Got to have a parameter in there, and it's not appearing. Stephen, help me out. Well, my initial thought is to do an indicator function, but doesn't the parameter appear in the delta function? I mean, yeah. there isn't it. There is something right here, but it's not telling us the constraint on everything. So I'm not saying what the values can be. So this is still unconstrained, really. But it's not saying what are valid values that I can plug in for the x's and the theta. It doesn't constrain that. So yeah, it appears up here. That's why I threw it up there, so that you can see it. But since these are both a half, I guess if this was like a quarter and that was three quarter, we'd at least see a little bit of information transfer in there. But the problem with that a half and a half, it doesn't appear. So you are right. Your first inclination is the correct one. So you're building a good intuition. So I need to multiply all of this. So times so all of this is going to be multiplied by a delta function that xi is an element of theta minus 1 theta plus 1 that is very important so this is my constraint on the model keep in mind Theta is appearing on the boundary of the space. It's helping you need to define the boundary of the space. It's actually the location of everything, but it is telling me about boundaries. So it's centering everything. And so we need this right here. This is actually all the information. This is the likelihood function. This little constant out in front doesn't help me. I can multiply it by any constant. All the info is here. So I'll write that down. All info. in here. Not here. Now, of course, if I made these numbers different, there would be a little bit of info in there. The thing would be moving up and down, and so I could build in, you know, I could learn using this a little bit, but I'd still need this. Okay, so my likelihood function looks like this. So it's just going to be a product of these two things proportional to 
I goes from one to two, fxi given theta. And this whole thing right here is just gonna be the product of two indicator functions. So x1 is an element of theta plus one, or theta minus one, times a delta function, then x2 is an element of theta plus one, or theta minus one. So my likelihood function is gonna be the product of these two indicators. There's a lot of info there. Let's see what it looks like. I'm gonna rewrite it just a little bit, and then we'll talk about the product. So we'll come back around to this. My favorite part of days is the likelihood function. So anybody that's in the likelihood functions, we're, we're one step apart from each other. I just like to penalize it. Sometimes. Let's see. So our likelihood function, x1 and x2, I'm gonna rewrite it just a little bit. I'm gonna interchange the role of theta in x1 here, and I'm gonna interchange the role of theta in x2 there. You can convince yourself that these are exactly the same things. This is gonna be proportional to, and I could write the one half in there, and I could write the one half squared, but it doesn't help me. So this is just gonna be proportional to all of that. So the halves don't help me at all. So this is gonna be equivalent to writing this down. Theta is an element of x1 minus one, or x1 plus one, times, delta function, theta is an element of x2 minus one, x2 plus two. So you can convince yourself when this is a one, that is a one. And when that one is a one, that is a one. And they're both zero and equivalent times two. So it's exactly the same, I just expressed it so that I have theta compartmentalized in one place makes it a little easier for me to understand what's going on. But if you want to write it this other way, that's fine. Let's draw it. So the likelihood function. I'm going to give us some numbers just so that we can understand and do make our mental math a little bit easier. So let's say Theta is equal to a four. I think that's what I said last time. And let's say our two cases, case one is gonna be when x1 is not equal to x2, and case two is gonna be x1 is equal to x2. So I get redundant information. So in this case right here, we're gonna have this thing, I'm just gonna say this is a three and this is a five, okay? So if theta were four, to get two different draws, the only possible draws that I can get from my original model and that's built into my indicator function is a three and a five. And I got to see both of them. So let's just think about what this likelihood function looks like. So my likelihood, is going to be delta theta is an element of 3 plus 1, 3 minus 1, times the delta function theta is an element of 4, I'll say 5 plus 1, Five minus one. I'll do the math for you. That's a four. That's a two. That's a six. That's a four. It's a five right there. So when does this thing peak? That would work. Four. So if I plug in any value besides four, one of these will be a zero. This is only a one. 
exactly one point on theta. And that's when theta is equal to four. So this is equal to a one if theta is equal to a four, zero otherwise. So my likelihood function, write it with a count x in there, peaks at theta. just gone, and it's a zero everywhere else. For example, that's four. In general, it'll peak at theta. That's great. The likelihood has all the info. Let's look at the other case, case two. This is gonna be our likelihood function will be theta, the delta function, Theta is an element, and let's just make this, I don't know, how about a three? So I'll say we got three. So this is gonna be three minus one, three plus one. We saw it twice, so I'm gonna square that. It doesn't do anything different to ones and zeros. And so this thing is gonna be equal to a one or a zero. This happens if theta is an element of two or four, and this happens otherwise. I'll draw this for you. So there are these two different values right here. This is going to be a two or a four right here. And they're equal heights right here. So this height is equivalent right here. function over theta, this one's a function over theta too. So in my opinion, the likelihood has all the info on all of this. Unless I knew something, and I knew how you were flipping coins, and I knew maybe you like bigger values of theta or smaller values. But if I didn't know anything, I might treat all theta as equally likely and place a flat prior. I want to remind us the nature of the parameter of theta right here. It's just shifting those values. And so I would say it's a location parameter. And if I want to be invariant to locations, I might use a flat prior. If I knew something about the thetas, I could build some other prior in here. But since I don't know anything, I don't really have any business doing that. So what I would say is I'd pick this proportional to one, flat, because it's a location parameter. At the end of the day, if you did use that, your posterior distribution would look like this. So for case one, I would tell somebody my posterior. So this is going to be a probability of theta. Just to make it really clear, x1 is equal to a 3, and x2 is equal to a 5. This is going to look like this. That's on that axis. This is going to peak just at 4, which is equal to true theta. And this height will be 1 after I normalize everything. And for our other case, my probability, so this is going to be the probability of theta given x1 is equal to x2 is equal to 3. I would say this is a two, this is a four right here. And if I use the flat prior, then I'd be treating everything equally lightly. And this would be a half right there. I could use my prior to kind of impact high values or low values, but I don't have any good rationale. So if I can come up with a good reason for doing something and maybe convincible, I don't do that. What I like about this problem is the likelihood kind of highlights all the info. So adhere to the likelihood function. And some of you might have principles for doing that. You might say, ah, oh, you should always use the likelihood function. I do. I think it's a good thing to do. There are some things that I'll do periodically where I don't use it, but it's rare. And so I think Bayes is kind of the, the clear winner here, and that's the case that Jim makes. 
If you want to read through that paper and go find online all of the responses and criticisms, you can. Um, Jim talks about something called the conditional frequentist where you condition on your sample size. And he says that there's no paradigm for really doing that. Like you could come up with an answer, but you always have to think through it. It's not a mathematical game. So that's kind of hard to build principles out of that. So I hope this problem at least highlights the difference. If I were going to come up with a um, Bayesian highest posterior density at a 100% level, I guess I would take those two values and just show them to you. So what I would really just report is that has probability of half. That has probability of half. And I'm done. And that's my set. You can do anything you want with it. And for this problem, everybody just kind of agrees. The point is, is that I'm going to report back a half and a half in 100 in this case versus 75%. If I did issue this answer right here and I just used one of these at random, I could build a confidence interval and I could give you the coverage interpretation, but I'm operating through a Bayesian lens. Okay, I think that's it, you guys. So keep your eyes peeled tomorrow or on Friday for a little bit of introduction to sampling. I'm just gonna tell you what the samplers are, how to use them, and then I'll come back next week and explain it all. Thanks, you guys. Have a great week.